Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Branches of Wisdom, the Banyan Books podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee, and very, very excited today to be joined by James Hollis, PhD. We had a few technical difficulties last week when we uh, tried to air this, and Jim was gracious enough to, to give us uh, another hour of his time today. So we're very excited to have him back. Before we begin, Banyan Books acknowledges that although people join us from all over the world for these live streaming events, the physical location of Banyan Books is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Most of Banyan's events and podcasts are free. We welcome your donations to keep these programs accessible for all. Just click on the PayPal link in the show description below. Also, letting everybody know that towards the end of our conversation today, we're gonna to take questions from the live audience. So go ahead and type your questions for Jim into the comments field on YouTube, and we'll get to many, uh, as many of those as we can. And just a note too, uh, it's difficult for someone, the guest, to answer particularly personal questions. So it's good to keep the questions to the content of the conversation or broader material rather than deeply personal material. Okay, our guest. James Hollis, PhD, was born in Springfield, Illinois and graduated from Manchester University in 1962 and Drew University in 1967. He taught humanities for 26 years in various colleges and universities before retraining as a Jungian analyst at the Jung Institute of Zurich, Switzerland from 1977 to 82. For the last half century, he has been devoted to sharing the insights of depth psychology via lectures on six continents, authoring books, and countless courses, as well as conducting an analytic practice. He has been instrumental in the formation and administration of young institutes and centers in Philadelphia, Houston, and Washington, DC. Dr. Hollis is a best-selling author who has written 20 books, which have been translated into over 20 languages. Titles include Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life, The Eden Project, What Matters Most, and Living an Examined Life. Today, Banyan Books is delighted to have Jim back for a second time. The first time we had him on Branches of Wisdom was back in 2020 when we discussed his book, Living Between Worlds, and you can find that episode on Banyan's YouTube channel or wherever you listen to podcasts. Today, he is here in conversation about his newest book, A Life of Meaning, Relocating Your Center of Spiritual Gravity. What is it that brings meaning to your life? Our culture tells us to seek wealth, power, prestige, or even enrollment in someone else's idea of a worthy cause. Yet, where do we turn when these paths fail to fulfill? our need for purpose. James Hollis says that when the old stories and beliefs that once defined us have played out and grown exhausted, our task is to access our inner compass, our inner compass the promptings of the psyche that help us find our way through the complex thickets of choice. 
and A Life of Meaning is a guidebook which can help us do just that. If you'd like to learn more about James Hollis, you can visit his website, which is jameshollis.net. And I just want to personally say how thrilled I am to have Jim here with us. This man is a true gem uh, with a huge body of wisdom and work that he's been gifting to us for many years. So Banyan community, a very warm welcome for James Hollis. Thank you very much, Ross. It's a privilege to be with you today. And I sincerely apologize to anyone out there who was uh, disadvantaged by the technical screw up that originated at this end, but Ross was kind enough to leave it ambiguous to act as if it was at the Banyan end of things, but I was the one who hit the wrong button and lost our sound last time. So uh, my apologies. And again, my uh, privilege and, and honor is to be involved in this conversation with you today, Ross. So I'm at your, at your uh, disposal. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. I, I want to just start with a quote that I think is a, a, a good entry point for us, um, where you talk about today's quote unquote, terribly split culture in which we see sides lining up based on ideologies and fears. You say that everybody has compelling fears and it widens the gap between us. We live in a culture of fear, fear of the shadow, fear of depth, fear of self-awareness, fear of others, and even fear of the other within ourselves. Then you go on to say, if we can't tolerate the otherness in ourselves, our shadow, how can we tolerate one another? I'm just wondering to begin with, can you clarify what you mean by the otherness in ourselves? Well, you know, uh, let me approach it this way. Someone asked me recently, do you think there's an intelligence inside of us? And I said, what, what do you mean by that question? Well, for example, who makes up our dreams and, and what are the purpose of our dreams or the appearance of our symptoms? And I said, absolutely. There is some sort of other cluster of, of awareness intrapsychically. I mean, at the literal level, you couldn't possibly manage all of those fine functions that keep your neurological system moving and your intellectual life uh, growing and developing and your emotional life and so forth. And, and at the same time, when we pay attention, and by the way, that's really what the word therapy means from the Greek therapoiine to wait upon, to listen upon psyche, which is soul. When you pay attention to what's going on inside, we're full of clues. There are intimations going on. And, and, and yet individuals can be intimidated by that rather than understand that that's a natural source of our guidance. You know, as, as Jung said, all of our troubles stem from one source, and that is that we get separated from our instincts. And by definition, life is about acculturation. You have to learn to adapt to the dynamics of family of origin, to the, the immediate neighborhood around you, to the culture and to the time and place in which you're born in history. All of those things outside of our control, yet all in some way offering provisional definitions and instructions to us. And it's no wonder that we get separated from the voice within. And so part of what the second half of life is about is trying to recover a relationship to those sources of guidance. You use the metaphor of compass in the, your introduction, Ross. I, I frequently quoted the aphorism of Emily Dickinson from the 1860s, who, who said, the sailor cannot see the north, but knows the needle can. And what she was intuiting was the decline of institutional powers in her time to mediate the mysteries. Why are we here? In service to what? Where do we go after death? What, what is this life about? How do I make decisions? What can I trust? Those basic questions, as Jung has pointed out, have become, in a sense, distributed among individuals in the modern and postmodern era. And he said, what makes us modern is not just being alive and breathing. He said, it's to, to, to understand that the, the burden of meaning has shifted from the tribe to the shoulders of the individual. And with that, of course, is a, a tremendous freedom and a tremendous obligation and a tremendous responsibility. So great that for many, that's a burden too great. And, and therefore, they're spending their time looking for gurus to tell them what's right or wrong or sociopolitical leaders or 
in, in many cases, um, simply burying themselves in the materialist culture that we have around us and deadening that voice that, that lies within each of us. Because each of us, and I can go on forever on this subject, each of us has these sources of guidance within us, the feeling function, the energy systems, with dreams, for example, symptomatology, and most of all, the issue of meaning. When we're in alignment with our own inner life, then we have that sense of well-being and that sense of empowerment and the sense of energy that is aligned within our nature. And of course, when we're not in that position, we can often force things through as we are obliged to, but something inside never quite feels right. And so people typically have to hurt enough for them to become able or obliged to ask the question, what's going on here? Who am I apart from my roles? Who am I apart from my history? How am I to make choices for the future? And how do I deal with the fears and the instructions that circumscribe my life so profoundly? And these are the sort of questions that bring people to books or sometimes to therapy and, 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 and appropriate venues, by the way. And with each of them, there is a summons to accountability. If I can discern what my own nature is calling me to, do I not have some obligation to honor that? And of course, to honor my obligations to the external world. Many times people have said to me, should I do this or should I do that in life, you know? And my answer usually has been yes. Try to find out a way to do both because one represents, let's say, a commitment to your relationships or to your obligations in life, such as being a parent or a partner. And on the other hand, where is it written that you're not supposed to grow and develop as a person? That's what you, you become in order to share that with individuals. It's not about narcissism. It's not about self-absorption. It's about submitting at some level to the uh, summons of your own identity. And that's what you most share with other people. Just one last piece about that, and then I'll shut up for a moment. When, when Jung said the greatest burden a child must bear is the unlived life of the parent, what he was suggesting there that where we're stuck, where we're blocked, our children will be blocked, or they'll be spending their lives getting unblocked. And therefore, the best thing we can do for them is live our life as fully and as abundantly as we possibly can. This opens the door for them, gives them permission, and gives them a model to address. You th That reminds me of, of a quote from the book where you, where you write, our recurrent denial of the summons to a larger life is probably our biggest shadow issue of all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, too often people think that you know, this concept of the shadow is about evil. And it certainly does in include our capacity for evil. But he always insisted, and I, I concur, that our biggest shadow issue is that we live too small a life. That is to say, we're, we're too defined by our fears, by our defenses, by our need to fit in, be acceptable to others. Think of the shadow as that within myself or within my affiliations that when brought to consciousness, brought to the surface, I find troubling or I find intimidating. None of us wishes to think of ourselves as avaricious. Or, or judgmental, or none of us wish to think of being caught in power complexes. But because we're humans, we, we will be from time to time. But all of those put together, as Jung pointed out, are not quite as important as the real issue. And that is, did we ever step into the fullness of our journey? When he said, using his own homey metaphor, um, we all walk in shoes too small for us. What I, what I think he was suggesting there is, we get caught in our adaptations and those adaptations were necessary. You know, as, as an infant and as a child, we are essentially powerless. One of the messages that life gives us and gives all of us is the world's big and you're not. The world's powerful and you're not. So how are you going to cope with that for a few decades? And that's what introduces a whole shadow culture uh, inside of each of us where we learn that certain aspects of our own personality, our personhood, essentially, are not safe to express or 
or we need to curb this or that, or we need to quiet or repress something in order to fit in, to be acceptable, to receive love and affection and support as every child needs. So when we think about shadow, we have to think about shadow as our summons to accountability. What is it that I'm not addressing in my life? Where do I need to show up in a, in a more authentic way? Uh, I, I've often said to my audiences, I'm a recovering nice person. That doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It means that I was reflexively trained to be accommodating to what's being asked for in my environment. Well, okay, that helps a person fit in. But then what if your environment is disturbed? What if it's uh, crazy? If I adapt to a crazy world, what does that make me? So I, I realized from the beginning, from childhood onward, we carry this inner split. And we know where our parsnips are buttered, as the old saying has it. And therefore, we all collude in, in pushing under our own summons to accountability, our own summons to grow up, to be who we are, to, to risk our talents, risk our calling, take those journeys you need to take, whether they're physical journeys or psycho-spiritual journeys. And in so doing, we sabotage, undermine the, the reason for which we were apparently brought here in the first place. What is it I'm to do here with this life? What is wanting to enter the world through me? Those are not questions that we ask ourselves until often later in life because they were there as when we were children, but we learned often to, to just, again, to submerge them, to adapt to our environmental demands, and that's how we lose ourselves along life's highway. Jim, something that I'm curious about, if you can touch on, is the difference or the nuances between really be finding our own journey, walking our own path, finding our own personal authority versus reacting to or rebelling against society, rebelling against our parents. Can you touch on that a little bit? Sure, sure. Well, we all know about adolescent rebellion and some people quite never grow up and they're constantly fighting some battle. And unfortunately, it's because they're stuck still in that history that, that uh, was very real for them at some point. Sooner or later, one has to react or rebel against one's defining limitations. Uh, how you do it and what way you do it is up to you. And if a person hasn't made that kind of break early in life, then it's going to fester there for a while. Um, in, in my own life, for example, I, I found myself when I was at age 30, having achieved all of the goals of my life. And they were rich and valuable goals, and I still value them but I also felt something was missing and I was experiencing a depression, incipient depression. And so uh, I, I couldn't imagine why I would be depressed if I had achieved all of these things that I wanted for my life. And, and then I came to realize that, that depression like that was Psyche's way of withdrawing its approval and support from the place where I was investing my energies and, and making some of my choices which is what sent me to my first hour of therapy. I didn't think, and that was at age 35, I didn't think, well, I'm starting a second half of life. Well, all I thought at that moment is how do I feel better? How do I get rid of this depression? Rather than ask the question that is central to analytic psychology, why has it come? Why is your, if your life is so well put together, why is it uh, not cooperating in this way? What is it that your psyche might want for your life? That's not a question that we're conditioned to, to know or to ask very often. What, what does the psyche want from me? And, and whenever we ignore that or we push through uh, in our usual defensive way, you can be sure that psychopathology will follow. By that, I mean symptoms such as the depression I was describing or, or a life of distraction or a life of self-medication. Sooner or later, the psyche shows up, knocks on the door, and demands its due. And if it's not today, it'll be tomorrow or the day after, but it sooner or later shows up. Everyone's invited to an appointment with their lives, and not everybody, of course, shows up for that appointment. Do you feel like uh, 
I mean, I don't think you're someone who speaks in black and white terms, but what, where's the line in terms of physical symptoms and psychological, emotional symptoms? Is there ever, do those ever arise and it's nothing related to our psyche? Not, it's not a call from life. It's just happens. Oh, sure, sure. Right. Yeah. Stuff happens, you know, there's in, there are independent trauma. I mean, my, my wife fell two weeks ago and, and she's unable to walk except a few steps at this moment. And um, she was in the hospital for three days. And you know, that, that was a slip on the bathroom floor. And it's purely physical. And there are times in which life's trauma, you know, hit us and overwhelm us. Um, I went through in the last two and a half years uh, about four surgeries and radiation and chemotherapy. I had uh, surgical uh, interventions in my spine. Um, I've spent a lot of time in hospitals and rehabilitation. I'm not able to travel now, so I'm grateful for the Zoom. Now, all of that at some level came to me. The question that really emerges from that, whether the origin of it is purely coincidental or physiological or whether it has a psychological dimension, it always raises a psychological question, and that is, how am I to live my life in the face of this situation over which I may have no outer control? And, you know, that's especially important as we age, get older, deal with mortality, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we recognize increasingly limitations that are built into our nature. In other words, the moment that infant is born in its DNA is aging and mortality. And we don't think in those terms, but it's built into it. It's always there. So the question that's always open-ended here, and I think it has a developmental um, dimension to it, is then how now am I to live my life in the face of these obstacles? And rather than shutting down, one has to say, how do I grow and expand in the face of these things? Um, Yeats expressed that paradox very well once when he wrote a poem later in his life when he was undergoing a lot of physical difficulties, medical issues, um, you know, he said, soul sing, clap hands and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Now, the tatter in the mortal dress are the changes in the body, of course, the depredations of nature. But how does the inner life compensate for outer decline? You see, that's a critical issue. That's central to a lot of folks in my practice at this moment is how do they grow internally as the outer world begins to diminish through retirement, aging, loss of partner, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to jump a little bit here, Jim, um, into this, the chapter two, where you talk about when things fall apart in the midlife transit. And, you know, there's this, you describe the, these passages where one Part of our life, one identity is coming to an end. There's a death, and then there's this in between before mm -hmm. something new emerges. You you talk about the difference between fate and destiny. Mm -hmm. That really interested me. Can you explain to our audience the difference between those two terms? Sure. Well, fate represents the givens that we experience in life. As I mentioned, you didn't choose your family of origin. You didn't choose your DNA. You didn't choose your time and place in history. All of those things are defining and delimiting forces within you. And, and fate is an energy system that blows through you, including, as I mentioned, our mortality. Destiny is what is possible from that organism. What, what, what is the capacity? What is the talent? What is the calling of that person? And, you know, <laughs> The famous analogy in every acorn, there's an oak tree, but very few acorns actually grow into oak trees because they're at the mercy of having the right soil, the amount of moisture and sunlight and so forth. And when that's there, the natural inner life develops. The entelechy of the, the acorn grows into the oak tree. Well, few of us are oak trees. <laughs> and uh, many of us might be working on that a little bit, but um, destiny is what is possible, what is capable, what is, what is wanting expression in the world through the person. That's something that we don't often think about. 
because again, in the first half of life, you're so busy trying to respond to what the world wants from you, what your parents want from you, what the school wants from you, what the employer wants from you, what the cultural milieu wants from you. And all of those demands have a certain legitimate claim upon you because we are social animals and we're creatures of our cultures at the same time. There is a summons for each of us to show up and to be the vehicle for life. It's not about ego aggrandizement. It's about the ego service to what is wanting expression through you. I never would have thought, and when I was a child, for example, I, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Well, the gods gave that body to Mickey Mantle. I never thought that I would be spending my adult life listening to people suffering. And I can't say I enjoy it, but I also have to say, I don't know of anything else more meaningful than what I'm doing with my life. And if I do find something more meaningful, I'll, I'll do that. So my, my destiny was somehow to, to be an educator and, and also to be present in people's process. Now that, that's a calling, that's a vocation, vocatus, calling. But I never thought of it per se as a job. You know, job is what you do to get an income, but th this was a calling and um, destiny is is what you are to bring into this world. And it doesn't have to be grandiose. I'm not talking about uh, inventing a cure for cancer. I'm, I'm just talking about being more fully yourself, because that's the person that you'll share with your partner or your children or your uh, workers at, at uh, the job or or simply those who know you that's that's destiny and somewhere the ego has the ego consciousness has to somehow s submit to the summons of destiny it's a struggle to deal with fate all the time because of its limitations but destiny is also seeking our expression and seeking us as a vehicle for its expression and then to realize nature or divinity whichever metaphor you prefer is wanting me to carry this value or this energy or this this set of of perceptions in the world into the world and it may be costly to do that many of the people that you would most admire in history are people who suffered a great deal whose lives were not something that, that you would want to repeat in your life however the reason that you value them is because somehow they held to that energy, that principle, that calling that nature had given them. I mean, one of the few heroes that I've had in the modern life is Nelson Mandela, who was, uh, you know, convicted in an unjust world to uh, a fate of life imprisonment, as he saw. But he vowed not to remain a prisoner intrapsychically. And out of compassion, he, he and his colleagues actually taught the jailers how to read. And so when they finally were uh, liberated from the prison on Robbins Island, they were able to, you know, their, their jailers actually expressed gratitude to those who had been their cap captives. And then not to be owned by the desire for revenge, which would be very human, very understandable, but to take all of that spent all that pooled up energy in, in service to trying to bring about re reconciliation, I, I think was an heroic accomplishment, uh, perhaps unsurpassed in modern life, because so easily one could have su succumbed to defeat and demoralization on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, rage on, uh, to, to carry one through as well. So those two force fields are blowing through us at all times fate setting our limits and and uh, destiny seeking expression through us and ego consciousness from time to time when it becomes aware of this can tilt the balance a little bit and step in to our calling step into our, our growth and development and rather than simply be a creature of adaptation you know we be we become a person whose life is more authentic because our choices are coming from a, a different place in our own psychological reality It seems like you you call it uh, at the at, during these passages you say there's three things we're called to and the first one is to it's something along the lines of answering the summons of our destiny. It sounds to me like what you're saying is when we do answer that call, 
there can be a certain amount of friction and suffering that we have to endure in order to hold to what we know is our path. But that is where the growth is happening. No, that's absolutely the case. Um, we're not talking about life being free of conflict or, or being easy. That's why I said many of the people that you would admire historically had very, very difficult lives, often the, the death of martyrs. And yet you admire them because they held to something that was true for them. And so um, it often means giving up creature comforts. It often means uh, making choices without those whom we value most understanding what we're doing or why. Um, people have said, for, for example, I've written a great deal. And the reason for that is it writing is just something that wishes to express itself through me. I, I write in the evenings after I've had a long work day. And what I've had to do is sacrifice those evenings with my wife or with watching a television program or something like that uh, for, the, for the discipline of, of writing. And I, I could have stopped it, but then it was kind of like, wh why would you stop something that is seeking to come through you? It's kind of like um, being pregnant and, and, and then deciding, well, I'm, I'm really not interested in being a parent after all. It's like, there's a calling there. And are you, what are you gonna do with that calling? So we're not talking about life being made simple. That's one reason why analytic psychology will never be popular because many of the other books I'm sure you have there, and I mean no disregard to them, uh, you know, offer promises that in f five steps you'll get this or that or 30 days to this or that. Well, uh, good luck with that. Try it. See if it works. If it helps, you know, by all means, that's wonderful. But most of life is full of conflict and suffering, and that's not being pessimistic. That's simply realism. And, and you're still asked to show up somehow and do the best you can. And the biggest obstacles there are our own self-image, which is often pretty poor, and also intimidation by fear. You know, we learn early, as I mentioned, life is big and you're not. Life is powerful and you're not. So how are you going to manage that? Well, you still have to step into it. And the, the great enemy always is, is fear. As Jung pointed out in 1912 in a book called Symbols of Transformation, he said, uh, the spirit of evil is negation of the life force by fear. Only boldness can deliver us from fear. And if the risk is not taken, the meaning of life is violated. That's pretty clear. Now that's my paraphrase of a little bit larger paragraph. But if you type that up and put on your bathroom mirror, I think it'll change your life. And I'll just repeat it. And again, this is my summary of it. The spirit of evil, strong language, is negation of the life force by fear. Only boldness can deliver us from fear. And if the risk is not taken, the meaning of life is violated. And that's a summons. That's an accountability to show up as best we can in the face of circumstances over which we may have no control whatsoever. I was wanting to ask you about that statement, which you include in the book. I'm really glad you brought it up. It is incredibly powerful. I wrote it down in my book where I keep things that I want to remember. Mm -hmm. And I'll invite our audience, if you're if you're watching or listening to the recording of this, listen to that a few times and really take it in or write it down or get the book even better. Um, in chapter, I think it's chapter four, you talk about the seven deadly sins through a psychological lens. And you actually refer to that particular quote when you're talking about sloth. Mm -hmm. You write, remember what Jung said, we all desire to drown in the unconscious. On the other hand, the spirit of evil is negation of the life force by fear. What was your what was your inspiration for for working with the seven deadly sins through a psychological lens? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it was actually a, a, a <clears throat> program when I did first in in Houston as a fundraiser, and I and a colleague spoke on the subject of seven deadly sins. I don't know who gave us the subject, but that's what we were talking about. But began to think about it longer and later. Um, sin is not particularly a popular subject in contemporary culture. Most people consider it a relic of the past. And yet, as our ancestors viewed the human condition, you know, and not 
did, ha did not have any particular understanding of the powers of the unconscious and what complexes were and so forth. You know, when St. Paul writes in the letter to the Corinthians, though I know the good, I do not do the good. The question comes up is why? His answer over two millennia ago was, um, or roughly two millennia ago, um, well, we just don't will it sufficiently. Acrasia, it's a dilatory will. We haven't willed the good sufficiently. But he also speculates there could be an other there, which he thought of as some sort of sinister force that pushes back against us. So there's a door opening into the unconscious, I suppose. But since then, we'd have to realize that the human unconscious is full of swirling energies and of mixed motives and of old complexes that say you can do this, but you can't do that and, and, and so forth. So I thought it would be interesting to look at each of those so-called sins and say, okay, what is sinful about that? In what way is it a perception of the universality and the timelessness of the human psyche? Because we keep seeing these behaviors generation after generation after generation. And, and is there anything we can learn from their understanding of why things don't go so well when, when one crosses certain lines? You know, I mean, where's the line between desire and destructive lust, for example? Um, you know, wh where is the, the line between desire for something and, you know, a, a, a devouring uh, materialism, let's say, um, or, or greed or whatever? Th those are still issues with us, and whether you use the language of sin or not. And by the way, the word sin uh, was originally from an um, archery term, and it meant the inability to hit the center of the target dead on each time. None of us, because of our finitude, is capable of hitting the center of the target. So sin is human. You know, the etymology of the word sin is um, suggests that it's unavoidable, right? We're, we're human. Or perhaps um, as St. Augustine wrote, um, if we're going to sin, let's sin consciously because we're, we wind up in these places regardless. So if the language of the sin speaks to you, then fine. If it doesn't, then you could see them as analogs to certain complexes that the modern carries and each one of them has the power to become domineering in the person's psychological life, make choices for them, and then, of course, then they have to live with the consequences, and, and so do others around them. I just want to take a moment to remind our live audience we'll be getting to some of your questions shortly, so go ahead and type those into the comments field on YouTube. Jim, in Chapter 7, Reviewing the Journey, you share your translation of a Rilke poem, which with which you have a strong personal connection. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share that with us and tell us a bit about what it means to you. I, I know it's on page 129. I don't know if you have your book there, but I've, I've I do. <laughs> yeah. oh, excuse me. I'll pull it up here. Yes. What page was it, Ross? One one twenty nine. It's okay. the end of chapter seven. Mm-hmm. I probably could recite it from memory, but uh, 127, excuse me for a moment, folks. What, 129. Oh, 129, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, this is a lovely short lyric by Rilke. I live my life in widening rings out over the world of things. I may not be able to bring it all to completion, but I will continue to try. I'm circling around God, around the ancient tower, and I've been circling for a thousand years. And I still do not know if I'm a falcon, a storm, or a great song. I love that because it evokes the image, of course, of the journey and the fact that we swim in mystery all the time and that, um, you know, our identity and our journey is something still undergoing revising or revisioning as we journey. And um, we need to carry forward our small piece of the puzzle. But uh, again, to remember always uh, the mystery that uh, courses through us. Jung said once in one of his letters, life is a short pause between two great mysteries. That's a pretty good definition of life, a short pause between two great mysteries. And 
So how are you to live that pause and in service to what values? That's the question that faces each of us. And then in chapter eight, you go on to talk about living more fully in the presence of mortality. And you talk about the obsession that our culture has with life, uh, life extension. Mm -hmm. But you also write that it's precisely our mortality, paradoxically, that makes possible, even necessary, our need for meaning. Sure. If, if we lived in perpetuity, I could do this for a century. And I could do something else for a century and then something else for another century. Nothing would matter. You'd be more bored than the jet setters who, who live this life of trying to fill time until they die and trying to step ahead of, stay so, one step ahead of mortality and aging. It is mortality that makes our choices matter. It's mortality that says to me, you may or may not have a life after this, but if you do, it's another life, not this one. The key is how are you living this life in service to what values? And what are your sources of, of support and, and wisdom in, as you try to make your choices? Those are the questions that each person has to ask individually and answer personally. And of course, many people never really do. So they're lost in the swar swarming materialist culture, buying the latest shiny thing from Apple or whatever, or have turned their life over to self-medication, or have turned the whole summons to accountability over to some guru or some social, political, or religious leader who's going to tell them what to do with their life. In, in the end, this is about coming back to the mystery of your own incarnation. Why am I here in service to what? What do I need to do in order to carry this journey in a meaningful way? And that's what gives our life depth and dignity. And I, I think also uh, from time to time in that process, as long as we're struggling honestly, our life will be flooded with meaningful experiences. That's the second time I've heard you mention the desire for many people to sort of give away their power in a way to to some organization or guru or or uh, somebody that's going to tell them what to do with their life. How do you how do we skillfully balance the need for a wise elder's direction, guidance, support with finding our own personal authority and trusting that? Well, it's a good question, Ross. Um, First of all, I think each of us has to be eclectic. Draw from as many sources as you can. If, if, if you, you know, Jung himself said, if a person's come out of a particular religious tradition, whether they're still in it or not, he said, I always suggest to them, they go back and reconsider what is of value there. There may be some riches there that you left behind that you can carry with you. If there isn't, you move on. And if there is, you take those but you also engage other sources of insight and, and you read, you write, you travel, you talk to other people, you, you, you acquire a range of options and you try them on. Life is in some way an experiment and, and we have to keep experimenting and, and to see again, it, does it line up with something inside of us that accords and, and therefore supports us? In other words, if you're doing what's right for you, the feeling function will support that. The energies will be there and available for you. And most of all, your dreams won't beat you up. You'll find it meaningful. And, and there is some sense of, of the inner life that is supporting the outer choices. We all have experienced the opposite of that, where we're off center and, and something inside of us is protesting. And, and something inside of us has to keep increasing the intensity of that protest until finally we show up. As I was saying in my 30s, I had achieved the things that I wanted to achieve and yet had to deal with a truculent uh, depression. What am I going to do with that? What, why is it here? What's that about? What's pressed down? And it turned out those were healthy questions and they led me to a complete change of career and change of orientation to a lot of other perspectives and in it, you know, thus begins the, the authentic journey. The first journey was an adaptive journey to fit in as best I could. Second half, 
stand up in the face of some of those adjustments and adaptations and, and step into this world. Thank you. We, we have some nice questions here from our live audience, if it's okay with you to start tending to those. Please. There's one from Nicola who says, hello, Banyan Books and Sound and Dr. James Hollis, and thank you for this live experience. Could you ask Dr. Hollis a bit about the concept of anima and its stages of development intrapsychically? Well, that's a huge question. And the anima, as Jung used it, and that's a Latin word for soul, by the way, was experienced in the male psyche as the other and was contrary to or, or complementary to, as the case may be, of, of a man's outer masculine identity and development. And it represented for him the world, this is the classical usage of the term that Jung created really um, over a century ago in the, in the teens and twenties of the last century, represent for him the world of feeling, the world of intuition, the world of creativity, the world of joy. And there's a dark side there. You can have an anima split. It's, it's, it, it, I was in the hands of the terrible, the uh, animus, the, the, the terrible dark figure that was there too when I had that depression. That's why in my first dream, I was in a medieval castle under assault by some sort of uh, witch figure out there at the periphery. And, the, and the, that was because the anima had been repressed in a significant way. And, and I devoted my, myself predominantly to the life of the mind and it was helpful and, and rich and inviting and led to a life in academia. And then there was a time during in the process where I was literally shuttling between the university campus where I was speaking and a psychiatric hospital where I was doing my internship. And I found that both worlds rich and inviting, but I found the conversations in the psychiatric hospital more real, more adult, and more compelling than those occurring on the campus. And that's what allowed me and, and obliged me to make that shift in my own life. And I left a tenured position that people would metaphorically kill for um, that would have guaranteed, you know, a life of, of uh, security and so forth. So I left the security, stepped out into the world to become m my own corporation, if you, if you will. And as a friend of mine says, well, the first day you do that, you better buy some disability insurance because that's the day you start losing your house if you're injured and so forth. But the point was, I, I knew inwardly which conversation was more compelling to me. I was drawn to one in the first half of life, drawn to the other in the second half of life. And I cite this personal example only to say that was the anima speaking. You see, the brain had made these other decisions, the intellectual side, but this whole feeling intuitive side was, was actually based upon initially avoiding the world of pain and suffering and so forth. I, I, I think I was overcompensated, too much living in the life of the mind and absolutely frightened by the, the descent into the, uh, the neglected world. And I've written about this elsewhere, but I, I had a very telling experience of witnessing an autopsy when I was at the hospital there. And there it was right in my face circumstances from my childhood that had involved hospitals and pain and, and discomfort and frightening and terrifying to a child were things I had fled. And here I was, my own psyche had engineered me to come back to work in a hospital. And I realized, you know, and ultimately you can run, but you can't hide the things that you need to address. You already know at some level have to do with the archaic fears and lack of permission. So the, the, the anima is initially caught up, to come back to your question, in identification with the mother. And that's why the importance of the rites of passage of traditional cultures, whereby the young, the youth was separated into the world of the adult male with its responsibilities and with its grounding and, uh, and its uh, archetypal stories and so forth, and as well as its assigned tasks. And... Um, Part of what we see today is an enormous culture of the Puer Eternals, the eternal youth, because young boys and young men today are, are, are not separated. We, we send them to a university and say, 
or I'd go off to the university, get an education, pick up some computer skills and, and find a job. But, but there's very little that actually grounds a youth in the importance of sacrifice, the importance of personal suffering, the importance of courage, of showing up and of pushing through your fears to the place where you need to go. Those are things that the individual has to find along the way uh, and, and maybe address the hard way. There's very little in our culture that helps people be mature. Quite the contrary, there is so much that keeps them infantilized. You know, a life of greater distraction, a life of avoidance, a life of narcosis. That's what popular culture offers us. Ross? Thank you, and, and thanks to Nicola for the question. Uh, there's another one here from Daniel that says, do you believe that the true purpose of long-term romantic relationships is to integrate our shadow side? So in a sense, our quote unquote real relationship begins after the initial honeymoon phase with all its crazy hormones? Certainly, <laughs> you know, I mentioned in the Eden project that there is within each of us a search for the magical other which is leftover childhood stuff and naturally and understandable. And I think it's unavoidable. It's the search for that person who's going to understand us, take care of us, fix things for us. And if we're really lucky, help us avoid growing up ourselves. They're going to take care of that for us, right? We don't confess that huge agenda. And we certainly don't tell that to the beloved other, but it's always there implicitly. When in fact, the greatest gift that relationship can bring us, if we can tolerate, if we can stand it, is the otherness of the other, is what obliges us to grow and to develop. Part of what happens in the romantic phase is that leaving hormones aside for a moment, which have their own logic, um, the, the other we, we see as somehow the carrier of our own intrapsychic projects and that they're going to somehow, if not solve and fix that, they, they will certainly be in the good fight with us on that, that front. When sooner or later, the reality of the other person, their humanity is going to wear through those projections and we have to face them as they are, a, a flawed and broken human being as we are. And then we have an invitation to a true relationship that out of that can come caring, compassion, and commitment, all of which serve for longevity. But the romantic phase of that, and it's possible to have some of that throughout one's life, I can assure you, but the romantic phase is usually short-lived because what is real sooner or later abrades the projection and it has to collapse. And when a projection, that's why people say, well, you're not who I thought you were, or I'm, I'm disappointed, you let me down. Well, that's always gonna be the case because they are not what we project them to be. That's something intrapsychic. And when a projection collapses or erodes, it comes back to us. And the real question at that point is, what I put out on you, the beloved other, has come back to me now, and what am I gonna do with that? How do I handle that? What do I, how am I responsible for that? If you're not gonna fix me and take care of me, well, either I can spend my life looking for someone I think who will, or I could grow up and say, that's my job. Let me lift that off of you. And if I lift that off of you, that's a very loving thing to do for you. That unburdens you a great deal. And I can also be, become aware that if you're putting that on to me, which is quite possible, I'm not able and willing to carry that in perpetuity. That's something that has to return to you. And so the ultimate gift of relationship is that the other obliges us to grow and learn. That's why we have a seminar like this. That's why we have, that's why we have museums. That's why we have books, is we're engaging the otherness in order to incorporate it and we grow larger as a result of that. And again, making choices in the necessarily eclectic way that we're obliged to make choices. Jim, where do you see the line in terms of taking back ownership of our projections, but also being okay with um, asking for reasonable, meaningful shifts or change in behavior from a, an intimate partner? Of course, sure. You know, one can't change without the other having to change also, as we all know. And 
you know, a key word for me is the word reciprocity. There, there needs to be a sincere reciprocity in relationship, although people have different strengths, different talents, different capacities. So I should not expect from my partner certain aspects of life of which are not part of her nature um, or her capacity and, and vice versa. So I'm still responsible for that. On the other hand, I, I can have enormous compassion for her and support for her as she grows and develops and so forth. And, and, and together, it's like one plus one equals three, meaning it's, it's not just the addition of another person. There's a, there's a dialectic there. That there, there's a conversation that can go on there. And it's not just in romance. It can, can occur in the classroom and it can occur in the seminar like this. It can occur in various places where the mystery of two people come to be present to each other. And we, we are able to respond to that, learn something from that and grow from that process. And that's the richness of relationship. In other words, the person who is appointed to take care of you and manage your life is already on the scene, and that is you. And accepting that, taking that on, is a, a loving thing to do for your partner and for your children. I can't tell you how many people I've seen through the years whose parents essentially said, in so many words, you are here to take care of me, when in fact that's not the case. The parent was there to take care of the child long enough to launch it. And from that point on, the child has its, its own journey. Thank you. Now there's a, there's a two part here from Linda. I think this will be our last audience question. Uh, first is a, a comment from Linda who says, a heartfelt thank you, Dr. Hollis. I'm so grateful you followed your calling to share your wisdom and insight with the world. Your teachings have been life changing and life-giving to me personally. And then Linda says, so curious of your thoughts on the concept of free will. You mentioned this briefly in one of your books, the paradox that perhaps there is no true free will, and yet we experience life as though we do. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Linda, for that question, uh, and for your comment, it's very generous of you, but um, there's a new book out. I can't remember the name of the author. Essentially, writing from a kind of neurological standpoint, saying there is no such thing as free will, that everything is in some way programmed within us. And I, I would have to say that um, there is a lot of truth to that. At the same time, I often turn to Jean-Paul Sartre, who said, you know, the question of free will versus determinism has been argued by philosophers since the beginning. And he said, it'll never be solved. And he said that our whole culture and our worth as human beings depends on the fantasy that we are free and therefore accountable. And I, I think the truth lies somewhere in between here. You know, we talked about the determinative powers of history at work within us, including our, our you know, genetic heritage and so forth, and the models that we see around us and the overt instructions we get from parents and from education and religion and culture and so forth. And all of those are determinative to some degree. It can show up making choices for you. But there is also a place where you have to ask the question, and this is a key question I think that can open the door here, is when you make a choice, ask yourself, all right, where is this coming from in me? What does that derive from? What has been triggered in me? Or what has been, what is that choice in service to in me? So I might do a good thing, and yet it's an old codependence. It's an old need to fit in. It's an old need to win your approval and affection, you see. And those are not federal crimes. They are simply the impact of fate upon my, my pro process of making choices. But I now know that. And if I know that, I can also say, I don't have to just rebel against that. That's the adolescent rebellion that we alluded to before. I need to say, all right, if I can ask the question and address it, and maybe its answer will take some time to come to me, but it will come to me. 
what is that in service to inside of you? So sometimes our choices, which we think are free and liberating and developmental, may in fact be modes of responding to some other pressure in our life and not generated from our own core. Or sometimes we're in service to an old complex is there. When I use the word complex, it's not a negative word. It's just referencing the fact that we have clusters of energy that life has given us, fate has given us, that tell us who we are, what we're supposed to do, and what our value systems are supposed to be. And some of those are of great value and are helpful to life, and others are you know, damaging to your soul. And it's incumbent upon you as an individual to sort through that traffic, figure out which voices come from those places and which voices come from the depths of your own soul. And that differentiation process is lifelong. It goes on forever. It's not like you figure it out and life will just flow smoothly. As Jung said, any solution you have today will need to be revised down the line because, you know, life is flowing onward. It's the flowing stream of Heraclitus. And with that, you realize that what was useful at one point in my life, I've outgrown now or is no longer effective. And it's a summons to a, a new energy and a new agenda, which is calling to me. And that's how we grow up. And that's how we become accountable. And that's how we become servants of life rather than simply creatures of, of conditioned responses. Folks, we've been speaking with the wonderful and generous James Hollis about his new book and many other things. His new book is A Life of Meaning, Relocating Your Center of Spiritual Gravity. And it was published by Sounds True. And originally it was uh, a talk, a series of talks that you gave for Sounds True. Is that right, Jim? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, it was originally recorded as oral presentation. So it's um, <clears throat> on... Um, CDs as well, if you prefer to listen. Jim, thank you so much for being here with us today. Before we part ways, any closing thoughts or, or words for the, for our audience? Well, just to thank you for the invitation to be with you today and uh, to appreciate the fact that there are so many individuals who are drawn to this process. You know, Jung, Jung said to be modern, to live in our time fully, is to understand that the burden of meaning has shifted from the collective, that is to say from the tribe, from the culture to the shoulders of the individual. Now this can be intimidating, but it's also a freedom and leads to a, 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 the potential for depth and for dignity in your life. And by the dignity, I mean a sense of respect for your, yourself in the process of trying to work through these things. Life is never going to be easy. It's never going to be simplistic. It's going to be complicated. Real choices and real values usually call for real sacrifices. But again, a sacrifice is making something sacred. Therefore, it's, it's worth it. So as Jung said, what, you know, the, the smallest of things with meaning is always greater than the largest of things without meaning. And how our culture has messed that up is pretty clear where we assume large and shiny equals of great value, when in fact there's a neglect. There's a, there's a poem by Thomas Trans, Transtrimer, uh, the Swedish poet, where uh, the person's being shown around a modern city and he's meant to be impressed with all the modern architecture and so forth. And um, he walks around and he looks, he says, I see, I see, it's very interesting. But he ends the poem. And so the slum must be inside of you. In other words, all of that, is a uh, razzmatazz distraction. What's going on inside of you is what's where the real drama is, and that's what makes all the difference. Jim, thank you again for being here with us today and wishing you all the best. Thank you. Pleasure being with you, Ross. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. 
please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.